what is certainly going to be an extremely exciting event about a topic that, as you can see also from the number of people present in the room, is certainly up in the agenda. There is uh, no one single day without uh, a news uh, globally on what's going on on electric vehicles. And that's exactly why uh, Bruegel wanted to really look into this uh, topic. And the way we did that uh, was uh, a month and a half ago to, uh, to publish a report aimed at really understanding if the European automotive industry is up for the electrification challenge. We wanted to understand if there is a role to play in Europe on the global EVs uh, race. And to do that, in the Bruegel tradition, we uh, assumed a data-driven methodology that will be later on explained. We uh, particularly looked not just at you know, the plans that the car makers are making in Europe about uh, electric vehicles production, but we really uh, looked at the research and innovation side. We looked at uh, patents in order to understand globally who is doing what in terms of innovation in the various uh, mobility uh, segments, in the various uh, uh, kind of cars, and uh, we uh, specifically add uh, then a focus on electric vehicles. Today, we have uh, uh, Renil de Wegelers, uh, senior fellow at Bruegel, one of the co-authors of this report, together with uh, Gustav Fredriksson, Alexander Roth, and myself, on uh, the, the electrification and the role of the automotive industry. But then we will have a panel discussion on this topic with uh, uh, some of the uh, key players in uh, this uh, uh, industry and also from a leading, another leading uh, think tanks uh, working on uh, clean, uh, clean mobility. Uh, we have uh, Eric Fontaine, electric vehicle program director at the group uh, Renault. We have Jacques Pierts, vice president for external and environmental affairs at uh, Toyota Europe, and Julia Poliskava, Manager for Clean Vehicles at Transport and Environment. Without further ado, since uh, the, uh, the event is very packed, I will give the floor to Renilde for the presentation of our report. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, very happy here to be able to present our research to such a large uh, audience uh, here. Uh, in Brugge, we're not used to so big of an audience, but I guess this is because the automotive industry is really an important uh, industry uh, here. So what we did in, in this, um, in this uh, policy contribution uh, is, first of all, to show the importance of the automotive sector in, for Europe uh, here. Uh, just in order to show that whatever goes on in the sector really matters for the EU uh, economy here. Then making a point that there are lots of transformations and challenges that this automotive sector is, is currently undergoing. Um, one of that is electrification, but it's not the only one. There is also autonomous driving, there is also sharing, connected cars here. So um, there are several of, of transformations here. We only focus on electrification of vehicles, which is one of uh, these challenges here. But the reason why we picked it is uh, also because it is connected to some of the other uh, challenges uh, as well. Um, and what we wanted to look at, is, as um, Simone already identified, is to analyze the extent to which our EU automotive sector, which is so important for our uh, economy here, how well it's positioned to respond to that uh, electric vehicle uh, transition here. So the purpose of my talk is here to give really very brief overview of uh, our analysis here so that we can have a discussion uh, with panel members uh, here. So first of all, show that the automotive sector is important in the European economy. I don't think I have to convince uh, most of you here, so we'll be very short um, on this. Uh, it's important for the EU economy because in terms of the value added that it creates uh, here, it's it's the biggest sector uh, compared to far also bigger than pharmaceuticals, for instance. Um, in, and of course, in some sectors, it's even more important, particularly in, like in Germany and then in the uh, Czechia, Slovakia, Hung Hung Hungary, it's also very important. Uh, it's also important in terms of employment. A lot of employment actually comes also through indirect, indirectly through uh, sales and maintenance uh, here. Um, that's, of course, a very labor-intensive part. The manufacturing of vehicles and, and, and spare parts is much more capital-intensive uh, and also way more concentrated in fewer uh, uh, countries here. But the, the sales and maintenance is something that's important in many different uh, sectors uh, here. 
course, the automotive sector is also important in terms of exports and our external uh, competitiveness here. And what we particularly also looked at is how important the automotive sector is for the innovative capacity of, of the EU economy here. And the automotive sector is actually the sector uh, where Europe specializes most its innovative capacity on. About one quarter of all R&D spending in the corporate sector by larger companies here comes from the automobile sector uh, here. So it's really important. Um, and uh, similarly, the EU automotive firms at a global scale in terms of innovation also hold uh, top positions uh, here with Volkswagen uh, on top of that in the sector, followed by Toyota uh, here. What we don't see yet is uh, companies like uh, Tesla or like Chinese uh, companies high in the, in the ranking of uh, corporate uh, R&D here. They are there, but they are still um, uh, small compared to the incumbent uh, firms uh, here. So overall, this is an important sector for the EU economy, not just only for its, its current performance, but also for its future performance and for its innovation-based uh, uh, capacity here. So then let's look at the challenges that this sector is, is facing here, and particularly the electric vehicles uh, challenge here. How real is that as a, as a trend? Uh, and how disruptive is this uh, so these are two very important questions. First of all, in terms of how real this trend towards electric vehicles uh, is. So one important point to note is that the, the, the shift towards electric vehicles really comes from the policy uh, here. It's the clean energy and climate change concerns, uh, clean air, um, which really drives a lot of policy uh, emphasis on re reducing um, carbon uh, emissions uh, here. And that, of course, uh, has put a lot of demand um, towards uh, cleaner um, cleaner technologies here, among which electric vehicles is one. So a lot of, of push from uh, and for the electric vehicles really comes from uh, that demand uh, from uh, more clean um, technologies uh, here. Another important push is that, of course, once that, that is sufficiently uh, established, then there are lots of technology improvements that will come from learning effects from scale economies here that will help to, to bring down further the cost of, of uh, further developing and producing uh, those technologies uh, here. So, so while the initial uh, uh, kickoff really came from that policy support here, once things start, start off, there, there is a lot of endogeneity in terms of uh, advantages and cost and, and, and um, further improvements. So this is also why we expect the growth of, of the EVs after kickoff really to further proliferate in the future. First of all, because the, uh, the demand from, for more cleaner uh, technologies from, the, from a policy perspective is likely to further be there and even further uh, increase. And secondly, also, as long, during kickoff uh, and when the production expands, there will also be much more, again, further learning and experience curve effects uh, here. Um, so that's why we do think that the trend is real. It has kicked off. It's real and sufficiently kicked off that it will continue in the future. That's also what we see in the data. So first of all, if you look in terms of the technology, so if you look at uh, in, for which type of um, technologies are, is the automotive sector um, patenting in, of course, it used to be really dominated by the combustion uh, technology uh, here. Um, you see that's still an important uh, technology for further uh, technology <coughs> Developments. So patents are still mostly in, in the internal combustion technology here, but you see that the, the cleaner technologies have started to kick off. And among these cleaner technologies, the red line is the electric one. It's actually the one that has most uh, clearly um, uh, taken off uh, here. Um, so in terms of technology, the kickoff has been taken place here. If you look at the demand for EVs, uh, you could say, okay, that's still very small. Uh, it's a very small part of the overall uh, current uh, demand for cars is electric. In the EU, it's 2%, so that's still very small. But you see the increase, uh, so th it's more the dynamics that, that are important uh, here. Um, in a number of countries, Norway is an exception, or so much of an exception that we didn't put it in the graph, <laughs> would be too much of an outlier here. Netherlands was an early mover, but actually has, has, has um, uh, dropped somewhat. Uh, but in all the other European countries, it's increasing, but still uh, very low. Also in the US, also in China, and Japan, but look at China, how strong the growth uh, there is. It's still a small part of the overall demand for cars here, but it's particularly the dynamics which are very important uh, here. Um, 
Uh, right. Okay. Um, also, what the expectations are is that this demand will actually further kick off. One way to illustrate this is, is Bloomberg, which really has this forecast on, on, on deployment here. And what you see is that every year these uh, forecasts uh, have actually become much more um, uh, positive here. So each time Bloomberg every year adopts its, uh, its forecast for the, for the next year here and is, is much more uh, ambitious on, on the electric vehicle uh, uh, predictions for the future uh, here. So also betting on this demand to be uh, continued in the future uh, here. So overall, um, we do think that the trend for electric vehicles is a real trend. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. <laughs> um, and another important point to note then is that the trend is also something that's really di a disruptive trend for the industry uh, here. So it will really uh, impact and transform the supply chains in this in this um, uh, in this sector here, particularly the supply chain as it was designed for the combustion uh, engine here. It's a much simpler, so it has much reduced complexity. Uh, electric vehicles uh, here, so it will will make manufacturing uh, much more simple. Number of jobs will be affected uh, here. Uh, but also very important to note is that the afterlife, after sales, uh, so the, the maintenance um, and after sales revenues will also be completely different uh, here. And remember, a lot of employment is in that after sales uh, part here, so the, that will definitely have an effect um, there as well. Uh, but also down um, uh, upstream uh, in terms of suppliers, uh, the critical suppliers in the value chain will also be different here. Uh, so it's much more in the electric vehicles, two critical components, and one critical component definitely is the battery here, which captures most of the value of the electric vehicle here. Uh, so the shift in where the value is mostly uh, concentrated in, in, in um, electric vehicles is different from combustion engine here. Um, so definitely this is a disruptive trend relative to the internal combustion uh, here. So it matters. We have to look at what is going on uh, here. Uh -huh. Okay, so now then the next question is, okay, what's the EU's position in electric vehicles uh, here in terms of the demand? Uh, <laughs> um, and in terms of uh, technology development uh, here. So if we look at the demand uh, here, so Europe is an important market for cars in general. Is it also an important market for electric vehicles? Well, again, that depends quite a lot on what push there is from governments for clean cars here, because remember, that's where most of the push comes from uh, demand for electric uh, vehicles uh, here, certainly initially. And then we see, if we look at the overall global market for electric vehicles here, the EU uh, is actually losing a bit of importance in terms of markets uh, here. Uh, and what you see is also the US is losing importance also Japan, and the biggest market actually is Japan here, although it's still a small part of overall uh, cars sold in, in, in China here. The size of the Chinese market and their uh, intensity of electric vehicles really makes that most of the market uh, currently of electric vehicles is in, is in China here. So Europe is for the moment not so important as a market for electric vehicles here, partly related to the, the policy support for electric vehicles. We'll come back to that uh, later. In terms of global manufacturing uh, of electric vehicles, uh, so also there uh, China has really risen very quickly as a global leader in manufacturing of electric vehicles here. Although the Japanese companies and the US companies were early movers, think of uh, tech Tesla uh, here, um, they actually have, have lost that early mover uh, advantage uh, here, perhaps with the exception of, of Tesla here. European companies entered much later in terms of manufacturing here, they, and they are now uh, somewhat catching up, as especially uh, German companies uh, are, are catching up uh, and, and coming in uh, later here. That's on the, in terms of production of electric vehicles, but as I already mentioned, the components are very important uh, and the battery is a very critical component. If you look at battery, um, battery manufacturing, there the Europe is, is not present uh, at all here. It's basically China and, and uh, followed by some of the first movers, Japan and Korea here, which um, and now we're competing or have to compete massive, massively with, uh, with China uh, here. So in terms of global manufacturing, definitely Europe is not, was not an early mover uh, here, but there, there is some signs that indeed we are uh, catching up uh, here. Um, 
so then um, was really the most important uh, focus of our contribution here was to look in who is actually investing in the technology and the technology development uh, here by looking at we did this by looking at, at patents uh, here um, as we already showed so electric vehicle patenting did kick off uh, but um, what we what we see is actually that also in this technology the EU was not the first mover in terms of patenting for electric vehicles here uh, it was a very strong player in terms of the internal combustion patenting uh, and it's still and it continued initially very much to bet on on internal uh, combustion here so it came was not the first mover in electric vehicles here but as you see gradually over time it actually did um, did also start invest in electric vehicle patenting um, and actually is, is now uh, catching up also in electric vehicles here so it was not an early mover but it is catching up uh, and, and also now is, is betting on or, or investing in patents for electric vehicles and if you see it's, it's now way more a mixed balance of uh, investing in patenting in, in still in the internal combustion engine but also electric vehicles so it's way more balanced compared to other countries uh, here which are focusing on either electric or on, on internal combustion here but Europe is still uh, very much um, it is starting to invest in, in, in electric vehicles but in a much more balanced uh, portfolio of different uh, technologies uh, here. so it's betting on, on many different horses uh, still uh, so the improvement of the internal combustion is still there as well. Um, so this is in general, but if you look at individual companies, you do see that there's lots of variants. Some companies really have different strategies than others uh, here. Um, what, we st what we still see is that, that uh, Chinese companies are not yet there in terms of technology development, still too small for that. Um, also, Tesla is not so strong in terms of technology development uh, in that respect. Um, what we see, so there is still room for, for European companies to really uh, be the leader in terms of technology development. And we do see that a number of companies are actually uh, forging ahead on that. Uh, companies like, for instance, Siemens, but also Renault, which have a, a much more substantial part of their patenting uh, in, in electric uh, vehicles here. Overall, what we do see, and we see this as a kind of a, a warning sign, is that if we look at the component manufacturers, um, they are much less involved in developing the next uh, components for electric uh, vehicles uh, here. So that's really a weak point for Europe here. And again, that may matter because a lot of, of uh, value added is captured in the components, but our component manufacturers are still, most of them, uh, overwhelmingly investing in, in internal combustion technology and not yet in electric vehicles. So that's really a weak part uh, here. Um, so what do we take in terms of conclusions and policy recommendations out of this uh, here? That I think is the most interesting. So we still want to be optimistic and say that uh, Europe can still be in the global electric vehicle race, which we think is a real one, um, and can, can even still be in a driver's seat uh, in the electric vehicle race here. This is because we do have strong uh, players here, uh, both in terms of manufacturing, but also in terms of parts here. Uh, and, and these players are strong not just only because of production and because of brand name uh, reputation, but also because they do have a strong innovation uh, capacity here, strong R&D uh, players uh, here. Um, and they do also have shown that they can actually go into new engine technologies here. So it's not just only capacity for internal combustion uh, here. Still, uh, there is also uh, dangers looming here in the sense that uh, the EU companies still are not sufficiently active in the new technology. They still don't want to leave their incumbent technology uh, here. So they, they are uh, spread uh, still quite over different technologies uh, here, which may make it more difficult to really go to the edge and specialize in particular technologies and be leading there. Um, that's in terms of technology. Um, in terms of um, the fact that, that we are not first movers, that we still need to catch up uh, is, is also important here. Um, and that holds not only in technology, but also in terms of, of production uh, here. Um, that holds particularly also for battery manufacturing. But what's also definitely, I think, a weak point for, for Europe is the limited growth in demand for uh, electric vehicles uh, here. So the market for electric vehicles uh, as we already identified, is for the moment mostly uh, in China here. The fact that it's still a small market in Europe uh, here definitely provides much less incentives for our European companies uh, to massively uh, 
uh, or be more ambitious in, in uh, their plans for electric vehicles uh, here. So our suggestion definitely is that Europe uh, should move into a higher gear to really make sure that we uh, keep our strengths in this uh, sector here as well. Oh, oh, oh. Um, so we need a, a much more, first of all, ambitious EU policy uh, here, and also much more integrated. So these are two very important components. Um, if we want our, our car companies to be much more ambitious in their investments in this technology, we need also much more ambitious EU policy approach here and much more integrated uh, here. So it cannot be single small, uh, small uh, interventions that will work here. As the best practice examples from uh, successful uh, countries like, for instance, Norway, but also China, illustrate it's not small things, it's really a whole integrated policy approach that works at the same time on all the, pol all, all the important framework conditions for firms to invest. That means working on the demand side as well as on the supply side. So stimulating demand is very important uh, here, so we need to push from demand. Uh, uh, in order to make um, these investments uh, attractive enough. Uh, stimulating demand by subsidies, taxation, and public procurement. Um, we don't necessarily want this for electric vehicles. Uh, we, we're not picking technologies uh, here. So we just want demand for clean uh, technologies uh, here. But then we still do expect that uh, electric vehicles will benefit a lot from that, particularly because of the kickoff stage that they are already compared to some other clean technologies uh, here. So stimulating demand in a neutral fashion, uh, stimulating supply also in a neutral fashion. Uh, that's on the one hand stimulating the technology development still with public R&D supports. Again, for the next generation of clean technologies, not necessarily electric vehicles, but clean technologies uh, in general here. Um, and also uh, support for the conversion of, of the dirty into, into clean here. Uh, not only subsidies, also standard setting, uh, regulation are very important instruments uh, here, uh, supporting, again, clean technologies, uh, not particularly electric vehicles, but clean technologies in general here. And then also um, the, the deployment uh, here, uh, infrastructure deployment, which will be quite important um, as well. So that's mostly where we concentrate our... our um, recommendations on very quickly to just finish. So targeting EU R&D funds, of course our public R&D budget in the framework program is very small compared to what companies are spending. Um, but that's why we really are uh, arguing for a very focused um, use of these, um, these subsidies for really those areas where there's still quite a lot of high risk uh, early um, early phase technology support here. Um, so targeted to those uh, areas. Uh, here. Um, very important is rethinking transport taxation uh, here, so carbon taxes for transport I think is very important. And again, it requires looking at all the parts of, of taxation uh, here, from ownership to usage as well. Um, so that has to be uh, much more dependent on um, decarbonization. Uh, and also what would be important too is to reduce the fragmentation across countries so that we would really get an EU market uh, um, for uh, decarbonized um, transport. Uh, cleaning up cars standards. Um, again, I think we really need very much more ambitious uh, standards in that respect uh, here. So we're arguing for zero emission uh, here um, in, in, in much more uh, sooner uh, time windows than, than is currently going on. And then finally, we also uh, want um, uh, we are also calling for more support for member states' transition towards cleaner transport uh, here, where the EU Clean Transport Fund uh, idea would be to provide funding for countries for projects related to the deployment uh, of, of um, clean transport uh, here that could be uh, infrastructure, alternative fuels infrastructure, but also funds for retraining uh, workers uh, from working with with dirty versus uh, clean technology production uh, here. So uh, I'm sure that these are things that um, uh, are definitely interesting <laughs> to discuss further here, so I'm looking forward to, to your uh, comments on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Reinilde, for this uh, complete uh, presentation of the report. One remark, uh, being in Brussels, uh, uh, these reflections today in Brussels are particularly important also because uh, being uh, the new EU institutional cycle approaching, uh, of course, the new European Commission will have 
to uh, take uh, some policy stance also in this field, which, as Renil mentioned, can be tackled from both an industrial policy perspective and an energy and climate policy perspective. The only sector today of the economy in which greenhouse gas emissions are strongly rising in Europe is transport. We have managed somehow to decrease emissions in all other sectors. Transport remains the bottleneck for decarbonization. And given the ambition of the Commission, of the institutions, to uh, reach carbon neutrality by 2050, this topic will certainly be at the top of the new institution's agenda. That's why all these reflections will also fit into the Bruegel's uh, memo for the new commission, which will be published uh, later on in spring, in order to feed uh, the new uh, commissioners with ideas on how to manage economic policy in, in Europe. Now, I will move to Eric, because uh, uh, Renault is um, one of the important players as far as uh, electric vehicles in Europe uh, are concerned, one of the early movers. What's your take on all this? Well, thank you. Uh, very interesting result uh, that you've been sharing. Uh, yes, in, in, in Renault, I would say we are a little bit in Europe, uh, the exception of the statement you made that uh, Europe was uh, late on this, uh, on this technology of EV technology because we have started the story uh, about 10 years ago and we have already more than 200,000 pure battery electric vehicle on the road, uh, which is uh, a significant, uh, I would say, experience. Of course, we don't know everything, but uh, we have learned a lot of the, the last uh, 10 years. Um, maybe um, just uh, to start my comment, uh, a few words about the number and the glass half full, half empty, because it's uh, always, uh, we can present really the, the two sides of the coin. Um, I think one, one uh, important point you mentioned uh, is the growth. I think the growth space globally and in Europe is roughly 50% per year over the last five, six years. So we have a steady pace. China is accelerating. It was 77% last year. But we are in this order of magnitude. There can be ups and downs. The US now is a little bit lower. But globally, we have this trend of 50%, which is already a very strong uh, point and which will obviously accelerate in the next year, especially uh, 2020, where we have uh, the strong uh, uh, CAFE uh, objective in, in Europe, but also in other regions of the world. Uh, so the growth space is high. Second is uh, the level, we say, is it small or big? Uh, now there is a kind of consensus about a 10% market share of EV. And when I talk about EV, I talk about pure EV. Uh, once again, not because in your presentation, uh, there was a hybrid in, in some cases. So I'm talking here in uh, pure EV. Um, and uh, this 10%, we can say, is, is it a dream or not? So what I can share today is that it's already a reality, not everywhere but it's already a reality, either in some geographies or in some segment. Geography, you mentioned Norway, uh, which is uh, above uh, uh, 25 in the total year of uh, 2018, above uh, close to 50 if you look at the last months of the year. Uh, so clearly, the good news is that people like you and me can adopt this technology in terms of usage and for on, on that kind of scale. And that's the good news that makes the 10% more realistic. Netherlands, China are above 4%, which is already very close to this 10%. Second angle, we, we look at the segment. You know the offer in electric vehicle is not very big yet. We have four or five cars on the market, but uh, if you look at the total size of the market, the number of models offered to customers is quite small, but where there is offer, this 10% can be reached. In our case, uh, on the B segment, so the, let's say, small cars, commuting cars, in France, for example, uh, electric vehicle represent 12% of our sales of this B segment car today, uh, year 2018. Huh? So this is not talking about the future. This double digit of EV exists in some geographies, in some um, segment here. Uh, that, that's one point. Second point is... I fully support the idea of the, the growth. And before talking about the technology, I want to talk about the customer. 
uh, and the demand side. The great news is that we are pushing this technology uh, and some other technology, but uh, those green technology, because there are some issues of the planet, some issues of the, our, our societies. But the good news is that this technology is customer friendly and people like it. Just make a test. Most of you have already driven electric cars. Look at the smile when people get out of the car and they say, wow, it's a lot of talk, it's silent, it's fun, whatever word the people use. But there is positive emotion because whether we like it or not, auto industry remains an industry with a lot of emotion. And so we are not going against that. We are going in that direction. Another um, uh, good news uh, about uh, uh, those emotions is that uh, a lot of OEM have now announced that they will move to dedicated electric vehicle platforms. This means totally change the way we design the car. Basically, we will take the battery and put four wheels in the corner. Uh, that uh, seems very technical, but it will bring very concrete benefit to the customer, which is linked to this structure of the car. And to be very simple, you will have one segment, one category difference in those new cars between the interior and the exterior. So you take a B-segment car, like Clio, uh, uh, or Polo, or whatever uh, you have, uh, and this B-segment car will have the interior of a C-segment car when we are moving in a pure electric uh, platform. So once again, we have the green side of the, of the car, but this technology is also bringing value uh, to the customer who wants to enjoy uh, more space in the car, especially when autonomous drive uh, is coming and that you can use the time and you can use your, your head or your arms uh, to, to enjoy the, the space. So that's really uh, the customer because I don't think we can push this technology against the customer. And really the good news that we see every day is that they like it. Of course, we cannot cover today all usage. That's for sure. And you mentioned it very clearly due to the balance between the size of the battery and the cost of the car. That's a, a very tough balance. And we need to work uh, more and more to decrease the cost. But still, um, uh, we, uh, on the segment we can cover, we can really match these uh, customer uh, needs. The technology is moving fast. Huh? Just to give you uh, one example, the Zoe we launched in 2013 was 150 kilometer range with one battery. In 2016, so four years after, we basically put in the same box, the same battery from the outside, the double energy for roughly the same price, to make it simple. So four years, you double the density, and you divide it by two the cost per kilowatt hour. And of course, this trend is continuing, and we will uh, uh, announce uh, and uh, launch new products in the next uh, months and years that go uh, further in this trend. So technology is going fast. Regulation is already very stringent. And, uh, and 2020 target uh, clearly can difficult, uh, will be difficult to meet without massive EV, uh, EV part. And, um, and last point, which is a result of all that, is that electric vehicle will come to parity with uh, combustion engine cost of ownership uh, very gradually, but starting with small cars in the beginning of the 2020s and then going up. Uh, to, to, to the bigger cars in the 2025. So that's uh, just a few facts to start. And two uh, last, I would say, comment. The first big change for our industry is that we are moving for, from a technology industry to an ecosystem industry. And that's very uh, disturbing for all, uh, all of us, um, changing a lot of things inside the company. Uh, because we have to work more and more integrated with other sectors, especially utilities, uh, which is totally new. I have created a team in my department of six people who don't look at the car as a car, but look at a battery with wheels that is sitting 80% of the time, not very far from an electricity grid. And the good news, by the way, is that the utility sector who was seeing us as an issue for them five years ago, and are coming to us asking for partnership because we are the solution, because they increase the renewables, they need storage, and the cheapest way to have the storage is the car. So 
that looks very nice on paper, but then we have to make it work, to make it acceptable for the customer, how you create the link between those two industries. And so really, the, I think the, um, the ecosystem is uh, very important. We have all the question about circular economy of the battery with the Second Life, where we are already very active in, uh, in reselling all the, the battery we are uh, taking out of, uh, of the market. So really, this question of ecosystem is deeply transforming our industry, and that's why uh, when we say, is the industry ready, I would say it's, the question could be, are industries ready? Because we will not do, the automotive industry will not do it uh, without um, other industries, especially utilities, or energy, or whatever you call it. And the second point is that the process to be ready takes time. And we can, I would never say we are fully ready, but we have worked and the teams have worked for the last 10 years to transform that job because it's really changing every job of the company. Not only the technical guy who is moving from a combustion engine motor to electric motor. It's everybody in the company from the engineering, the plant, the salesman. Just imagine that a salesman needs to discover the usage of the customer of the car, which he would never do when he's selling uh, diesel or gasoline. So there is a change in all steps, and that's a transformation that we all have to, uh, to, to go through. A few conditions of success. We are putting a lot of money, a lot of efforts in this transition. I think the support uh, from the ecosystem needs to increase, as you mentioned. I would mention a lot the non-financial incentive which are, of course, politically much more acceptable. I'm talking about uh, uh, the example I experienced this morning in uh, Paris Station, where I could save 10 minutes of sleep because I could uh, park in front of the elevator and not look for uh, a space for my car. Uh, it's also true uh, in the airport. The bus lane that you can use in Oslo when you're driving an EV and you save uh, time every morning. All those benefits that create uh, not only the cost side, but also the practicality, the easy to use side. Uh, so that's really uh, one, one side. Uh, second thing, we are talking a lot about charging. Uh, we have to all remember that most part of the charging is done at home or at the office. So we are not in a car business model, we are more in a phone business model, where you rarely go somewhere just for the purpose of charging. You basically charge where you are. And on this topic of charging, on our side, the first priority uh, is how you manage condominiums, which uh, re with uh, either people who don't have a parking place and then you need to recharge on the street, or who have a parking place, where, but the administrative procedure to get the charger there, even if sometimes it's planned in the law or whatever, uh, is always a nightmare and definitely not compatible with the time frame of the purchase of a car, which is, let's say, two months or three months maximum. So this is a very concrete area where, anyway, we will have to do the job. It, will, it can take two years or it can take ten years. And I think it's really a, a focus that, uh, that we can uh, do. And the second topic, we don't talk so much about it, is uh, the quality of the public charging. There is today uh, a lot of chargers that have been installed, especially thanks to European funding in many, in many cases. The problem is that those chargers are enough at this stage and are growing at the right pace. So for me, it's not a big concern. The big concern is that they should work. And people who install them often forget that you don't have only the investment, the capex, but you have also OPEX to put on it because it's a technical uh, asset that needs uh, maintenance, uh, that ha can have issues because it's open to the public, uh, et cetera. And so that's a big concern that people know there is a charger, go there to recharge, and fail to recharge just because it's not working. So that's uh, uh, the second very concrete, very, I think, manageable at uh, the scale of the EU uh, step that you can make and that can have a, a very big level on, on the growth. But uh, in general, I'm very optimistic because I see we are all concerned about the topic and uh, we will uh, make it happen, uh, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, also for this slide of optimism. I will then turn to Jacques because uh, Toyota as a car maker has, uh, 
assumed a different position vis-à-vis uh, -vis electric vehicles, uh, as different uh, uh, focus on hybrids and uh, hydrogen cars. So it will be also interesting to have your perspective on this topic. The floor is yours. Well, first of all, I uh, wanted to congratulate on the on the quality of the, the study and all the topics that you touched upon, which I, I think is gives a very balanced overview of uh, where we are today and what needs to be done to be there tomorrow. Second point is that uh, to speak just after the European leader on battery electric vehicles is quite, is quite a challenge. <laughs> and and uh, which, which allows me to, um, um, a little bit, sorry, to contradict you. Um, we don't have a different view on battery electric uh, vehicles. Um, we are not advanced in terms of uh, concrete products um, on, on off wheel but I can tell you that in terms of R&D, um, in terms of investment, um, you maybe have seen that we recently announced a, a joint venture uh, with uh, Panasonic to work on uh, prismatic batteries and uh, also on later on solid state, uh, so solid state batteries. But I would like to um, bring to this, uh, to this debate uh, an, an angle that is uh, not different, but I think uh, additional. Additional in the sense that uh, what I hear today is, in general, um, is that um, um, politics, uh, cities only talk about battery electric vehicles. And uh, whereas there are certainly applications for pure battery electric vehicles, uh, there are also applications for electric vehicles that generate the electricity by themselves through hydrogen. And um, where should I put it here? In which direction? Ah, in that direction. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this this is part of uh, um, the left part of, uh, of of two slides or of one slide, but I could not put everything on on, on one slide. Um, what I think is very important is uh, the source of the energy, be it electricity or uh, or hydrogen. So our focus mid to long term is really to uh, look at uh, uh, electricity and hydrogen produced from. Uh, renewable energies and one of the strengths of, uh, of uh, hydrogen is that it's cheap and easy to store it to, uh, to transport so you see here you've got uh, all the uh, you've got all the lines you, you've got the sources including uh, co2 uh, capture possibilities but with energy solar geothermal and uh, biomass which can go straight to uh, the grid, or that can be uh, through electrolysis uh, transported to hydrogen, transported by trucks or by boats, or even by uh, existing uh, gas pipelines that uh, exist in, uh, in Europe. In terms of application, we uh, really believe at Toyota that uh, the approach must be much broader than just passenger cars. Um, that there are applications for buses, for trucks, for forklifts, um, also in uh, residential um, applications and in the uh, industry. So I'm kind of an advocate for hydrogen more than <laughs> purely for, uh, for, for Toyota, as you, uh, as you can see. Um, so th this is the kind of timeline on a more global uh, basis. I mean, when I say global, we have to understand that this is the more developed countries like uh, Japan, uh, Europe, US, but also what uh, we understand is a growing interest in China for uh, hydrogen as well. So um, currently we are still in the process of launching uh, hydrogen applications. Um, since 2015, we launched the uh, Mirai, which, is, which means uh, future in, uh, in Japanese, and which is a hydrogen uh, fuel cell um, vehicle. It has a range of, an official range according to uh, uh, test cycles of 500, 
but in reality, you know, there's always a difference between test cycle and, and reality. It's more around 400, 425. But it embarks uh, five kilos of, uh, of hydrogen. So, um, looking a little bit further uh, forward, today we're producing 3,000 Mirais per year. So, it's very little. But as from next year, we will uh, complete the line uh, for that car and we will uh, multiply by 10, going to 30,000 uh, fuel stacks per, uh, per, per year. And then really continue to work uh, in, on uh, establishing a full-fledged hydrogen-based uh, society. So the trucks, uh, we now have three trucks in the harbor of uh, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, 7-Eleven in uh, Japan, we have an agreement and these are their delivery, uh, city delivery uh, trucks uh, based on uh, hydrogen and the, uh, the bus. You also see um, Energy Observer, it's a fascinating uh, experience, it's uh, the first zero emission uh, vessel. Uh, that produces electricity through solar panels that you see on top. And when they have excess electricity, they store it in uh, hydrogen, which they then use when they uh, lack uh, solar energy. Why am I showing this? Um, these are hybrid uh, electric vehicle sales. Um, actually, I joined Toyota 20 years ago. That's when we launched uh, the, the first Prius. And uh, we were you know, organizing uh, test drives everywhere, trying to convince people that that was a, a, a valuable um, way forward uh, to increase the electrification component of the vehicle. And at that time, people said it cannot work. That has no future. It's too expensive. Um, we don't see how you can uh, live with that. And it took us... 10 years to reach the first million uh, hybrid vehicle. Today, we're uh, on a global basis, we're at a range, uh, at a, a range between 1.3, 1.4 million hybrid uh, electric uh, vehicles, and uh, of which uh, 2 million in, uh, in, in Europe. So uh, the point here is that customer ac acceptance takes time, even though this technology did not require any infrastructure. The other element that uh, is very important for customer uh, acceptance, but also for the viability of the industry, is to reduce the cost. And between the first generation and the fourth generation uh, um, Prius, we managed to reduce the cost by 65%. Our aim uh, is for uh, the next generation of uh, Mirai, so the fuel cell, to reduce uh, the actual cost by 50%. So cost is very important. Cost is very important, um, and, and currently that's what I want to show here, is that if you currently look at the CO2 regulation, all the focus and all the <coughs> obligations are put on the, on the sector, on the industry. But we cannot do it on, on, on our own. And the key point, and that I have not heard except <laughs> um, today, is the word customer, customer acceptance. Any new technology needs time to be accepted by the customer. And customer acceptance is based on affordability, which brings us back to reducing the cost, that's our role, but also in terms of uh, incentives to uh, help launch the, uh, the, the technology, and convenience, and convenience then links much more to the uh, infrastructure and the ease of uh, refueling the, the vehicle. This is two days um, old. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I just want to, this is from Automotive and Sport. Uh, every year they make, uh, uh, and, and not only in Germany, they've got uh, many publications, they uh, make a, a reader survey 105 people uh, replied from 12 different uh, countries. And um, you see that they asked which drivetrain will gain in significance in the future, whatever the future may be. Yeah? And you see the, the purple line where hydrogen is, uh, is uh, significantly 
uh, increasing. But as I said, we cannot do it uh, just on our own. Governments and energy suppliers really have a key role to play, be it for hydrogen or for electricity. Today, the infrastructure um, is uh, very much concentrated in... Uh, my glasses are not good enough. Um, but in, in a few countries, 75% of the, the recharging uh, infrastructure, public recharging, uh, because we discussed before, you said yes, but there's also private uh, uh, in the houses, people who have, uh, have got a garage and a plug. Um, and the, the, the Commission has set a, a target, and I'm sorry, but the slide has moved a bit since I sent it. Um, the, the EU has set a, char uh, a target of having one charging point for 10 uh, vehicles. And the best practice is absolutely Holland, um, and we can come back later on, on that. They've got four vehicles per charging point. But countries where uh, uh, electricity, battery electric vehicles like Norway, for example, um, are very successful. And here again, I'm talking about uh, public charging points. They've got 27 vehicles per charging point. So well above the, the, the limit set by the EU. Um, but if you've got a house with a garage, which is in many cases the, the reality in Norway, it's not an issue. If you live in an apartment or a street without a garage, now, um, that I was talking about, uh, about, about uh, battery recharging, but in hydrogen refueling, we're, <laughs> we're not better. If you look at, uh, at where uh, it concentrates, it's essentially Germany with 60 active uh, refueling stations, hydrogen, for a total of 100 and 107 today and 51 in, uh, in progress. So. Uh, there is uh, still significant efforts to be made on that level as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacques, for this complimentary uh, presentation. And then let's move to Julia to also get uh, your view, I guess, more general on all this issue. Julia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, real pleasure to be here. Um, also, very much welcome the report. Um, very timely. Um, some really good, good conclusions, great analysis, and, and largely agree with, with most conclusions and, and recommendations. Um, so in my 10 minutes, um, I wanted to go through some of the maybe key issues, key areas, some of the analysis uh, around it, uh, but also focus especially at the end on what's next and, and take apart some of the recommendations and, and, and focus on them from, from the report. Um, First of all, uh, investments. Um, this study actually was, was quoted in, in your study as well. Thank, thanks for that. Uh, this is already from last year. Some numbers probably need, need to be updated, but this is just kind of shows the picture of where investments, when it comes to mobility, are going today. Largely, it is China. And I would like to very much especially... Um, um, second, especially the finding in the report that it's even worse in the supply chain, that when it comes to the value chain, things like batteries, it's really in Asia, not in Europe, where the companies are capturing the value of those investments, which is incredibly important. When we look to Europe, we really have just one European player really promising to start producing batteries next year. It's Northvolt in Sweden, but some other consortia in Germany, for example, we are waiting for a new announcement any time now. It's been delayed. The French announced something with Zaft, but again, uh, we haven't seen any progress, uh, but we see Asian, Asian companies coming to, to Europe. So we really need to do much, much more to especially capture the value chain, the, the supply chain. And having a, a local and integrated supply chain with European companies in all of the steps is really important if we are to learn from, for example, what happened in the PV sector where we had the market and Chinese kind of basically provided us with technology. It's one thing to learn is we need to have our supply chain. Um, supply chain does come with the market, with, with demand. And we see it in diesel, for example. We have a fantastically integrated diesel supply chain in Europe and a diesel market. So when we are also serious and we are rolling out the EV market here, supply chain will also come. 
I would like to make just one very short uh, disclaimer here. When, when we say electric vehicles as TNE, we mean it in a bit broader uh, engineering way. Whatever car is driven by an electric motor, so it's battery electric, it's also fuel cell electric, and, and it's plug-in hybrid. We would, though, say that for us, policy should prioritize zero emission technology over low emission technology, which is important. Both are important, but incentives need, need to be targeted. But when I say EV, it's in, it's, it doesn't only mean battery technology. And in much of our research, we, we focus on, on a number of technologies. Um, so that's on investments. Now, uh, jobs. I think uh, there was a battle of the job studies last year in, here in Brussels, as everyone was uh, discussing the European uh, legislation on car and van CO2 standards. Um, there are probably two, two streams of thought here. On the one hand, we can look at the economy as a whole. What would transition mean for our economy in terms of jobs? Or we can look specifically at just one sector, motor vehicle manufacturing as it is today traditionally and, and look at impacts. If we look at the economy as a whole, uh, I just summarize here the study that was done, uh, Fuel in Europe's Future Study by Cambridge Econometrics, that had on board manufacturers, trade unions, uh, other associations and NGOs, um, run by the European Climate Foundation, also here in the audience, which clearly shows that um, up to 200,000 jobs will be created in different sectors of the economy from the switch to, to zero and, and, and low emission mobility. In particular, of course, in electric equipment sectors, hydrogen and electricity production, and so forth. If we look, on the other hand, just at the automotive manufacturing narrowly, it is true that no matter what we say, the jobs in that sector will decrease. However, one, by a very small margin, a lot of analysis, including by the Commission, shows is just a few percentages, percentage points. Two, importantly, they will increase no matter what, which is really important. If we keep with diesel here in Europe, and again, the, the report clearly states that our industry, automotive industry, depends on exports. Diesel market is losing its share. It's non-existent already in, in light duty sector anywhere else in, in, in the world. It's dropping in Europe. So if we are continuing to produce the technology for which the market is decreasing, there will be job losses and, and there will be layoffs. And we already see it in, in many announcements in, in the UK, notably with, with Jaguar Land Rover uh, some months ago, that are connected to being linked to the diesel market. And, and final point on that, third point is, jobs will also decrease because of automation and increased efficiency gains. So the only way, and that happens all across the, the sector, not just in automotive, but it is a trend. So the only way for us to uh, replace and balance out those job losses is by investing in another sector, in a new sector, and really developing and, and, and growing and taking new opportunities. Uh, and this is why we would say that overall, the drive definitely, definitely creates more, more jobs. It's a transition. It means there will be losers, and that's where we have to manage the transition. I have no doubt that there will be some small suppliers in, in southern Germany, for example, that will be impacted. But we will not stop the change. We will not stop the transition. So we should focus on helping, reskilling, upskilling, what we can do, but at the same time in investing in, in the future and, and embracing it. Um, there was also a study just a few months ago by the European Association of Electrical Contractors, um, there's always a mouthful here in Brussels for associations that also show that just for the electricity sector, there also will be hundreds of thousands of jobs created. So there's a lot of, a lot of potential. So let's embrace it, not, not fight it. Um, and um, um, another uh, final piece of uh, analysis, um, sales speak for themselves. Unfortunately, it's bad news. I, I do agree completely with with overall argument that it's still not too late for Europe to, to, to really uh, get into the race and win. However, if we look at the very latest 2018 sales data, for the first time in years, we're not number two in the world, we're number three. We have been overtaken by Trump's America, uh, how, uh, no matter how surprising it may seem, given the policies of the current administration. 
um, especially in the last quarter, which of course does coincide with Tesla Model 3 sales. Uh, I completely agree with that. Uh, but we have been overtaken and actually the difference is not big, but it's significant in terms of the signal itself, in its sense. Why is it that manufacturers here in Europe are not ramping up the, the, the sales? One of the answers, uh, taking Tesla uh, aside, is the fact that here in Europe, what we have seen until today is that manufacturers have largely followed the regulations, doing the minimum needed to meet the regulations, rather than really being serious about this market, as, as they are in some, in some other markets uh, globally. So we will see many, many more models coming next year, for example, and you can also see it in that analysis, it's, it's, it's brand new, we're about to, to actually release a briefing, but we will see um, uh, 24 new models next year, 29 models in 2020 of, of electric vehicles, but it is because manufacturers have to sell them to meet the 95 gram per kilometer target. So it is still driven by regulation. We still don't see that good faith, good leap of faith, let's really make the market here. It's, it's, and as long as it's, uh, it's, it's that, we don't see that we can really be serious in, in, in that race. Um, it's not to say that that's all manufacturers. I do have to agree that there's definitely some front runners. We, of course, have the first European front runner, Renault, here, Volkswagen as well. Some of the things they're announcing, the platform, the MEB platform for, for electric vehicles, certainly means that some of them are serious, but we still don't see the, the, the genuine leap, leap of faith. Um, so what's next? Uh, I've tried to structure this um, a bit in line with, with the report, uh, so it's kind of aligned with the recommendations that were discussed. Uh, I think first and most important, I cannot agree more with the report that what we really need uh, and what we can learn from places such as Norway or China is a long-term consistent framework at all levels, demand, supply, European, national, local level. It's way too often when we have, you know, we, one right arm doesn't know what the left arm is, is doing. And there's a lot of examples. I can just bring you one recent one I came across. It's very difficult for member states to, uh, today to, give, to exempt electric vehicles from VAT, value added tax. Commission did some proposals, revamped completely the way it's done, um, said that, you know, there's just some products on which you can't exempt, but for the rest there's flexibility. To cut the story short, uh, this comes to the European Parliament and the Rapporteur and the Economics Committee deletes that provision. So again, it's not possible to exempt uh, vehicles. Um, this is just uh, whatever economics or liberal thinking was going on. This is just to show that there is a lack of consistency when it comes to our policy making. Um, and, that, uh, so in, and that's across the field, whether it's funding, whether it's taxation, whether it's city policy, it's really missing. I would go further and, and take it the next step, not just consistent policy. The next commission really needs to set e-mobility, zero emission mobility as their industrial climate and all other key priority in its policies. So all across the field, we, we have consistency in, in, in this. Um, on funding, a few words on funding as well. I, I agree again with the conclusions of the report. The only thing I would say is we, we need to put our money where our mouth is, for sure. But we do need to maybe move one step away from just this idea of uh, lab, exciting laboratory, small scale, you know, research. If we want to capture value chain, if we want to have battery technology here, we need to go big. We need to have large industrial scale. And it's important. And, and we have tools already, the EIB can be used for companies to leverage large private sums of money just by securing some of that investment, for example, making it less risky, de-risking it. So this is really very important as, as, as a focus. Um, in, again, on, on solid-state batteries, yes, absolutely, it is probably the next step in the coming years, but to help industry build batteries now, we need to support them in the current and next stage of lithium-ion batteries, still with um, liquid electrolytes. So there's not just next stage, but let's think of, of this step now and, and, and what we can do. Third, uh, taxation. I think this is the only area where maybe I would question the, the, the um, assumption that we need to harmonize taxes across Europe. Um, I think in principle, harmonizing or making taxes um, consistent is a really good one in the ideal world. I think in practice, if we're serious about the way it works here in Europe, 
First, we will probably wait a century before the taxes are harmonized. It's a very long process. Think of the energy tax directive. It's, it's still blocked. We still add it to our policy recommendations for five years in a row. It's, it's just not happening, but we need to act fast. We, we cannot wait. Um, on on uh, taxation is incredibly important for demand side and you know, client perspective was mentioned and the affordability. There's a lot we can do with tax, uh, probably not at European level. It needs to be a smart taxation reform at national level. First, we would say we need to target fleets, corporate fleets, company cars. It's already a premium market. It's less sensitive. You know, if we think of Gilles Jean, no one will argue that we should, you know, corporate car market is less socially sensitive. We can really take some best practices from places like the Netherlands and make sure that that uh, benefit in kind schemes really drive and accelerate the transition to, to electric vehicles by, by reduced rates, for example. It can really work and it has shown to work in, in places like the Netherlands and more recently in, in the UK as well. Um, and bonus malus schemes. If we are accelerating our and rolling out electric vehicles, the reality is we will have a lot of them in the years to come. And continuing with uh, these grants, purchase grants that we have today, is really not sustainable. We just did a very quick out from the envelope calculation to show that just in France, for example, alone, in 2025, the amount of electric vehicles that need to be sold for European standards would amount to 4 billion euros uh, subsidies from the government each year. It's not sustainable. Bonus malus schemes, on the other hand, like in France, like in Sweden and, and some other places today, Italy most recently, is a more sustainable way where you subsidize the more cleaner vehicles, zero emission vehicles, battery electric vehicles, with higher taxation on the more higher polluting ones. And in, as such, it's, it's, it's a more durable option. Uh, it, it needs to be smartly designed uh, because you really have to be targeting not just 3% of the highly emitting ones, but really what is the CO2, majority of CO2 emitting vehicles. Um, so that's on taxation. Uh, and two more points I have left. So number four, on regulations. Um, I agree, emission standards are very important. I would say that that was all we talked about here in Brussels last year. And we now do have a framework. Uh, we can all have different opinions about that framework. But I would say that I would rather, uh, you know, as a call to everyone, as, as especially industry here in the room, to say, let's work together to make it happen. Let's drive the demand. Let's drive the infrastructure. Let's improve the taxation to make sure we implement it. The standards as they are are still not uh, a given that we will have a large EV market, unfortunately. There's still uh, CO2 taxes, not EV-specific targets. They're based on laboratory tests. We still need to monitor that there is, again, good faith to, to monitor them. But it's a good starting point, and, and I really, uh, as, I, as I say, a call to all, let's, let's make it happen rather than do the minimum regulatory needed. Finally, on, on infrastructure, a lot has been said already, and, and, and I, I agree a lot with what's been said. I would say that today, based on where uh, cars are, we do have enough charging points. But we absolutely need to do more, especially in the residential off-street parking. This is where local level is really important. STNE, we are trying to install a, a charging point in our garage. It's a nightmare. It's just a nightmare. And this is, it's, it's, it is really important. And, and again, you know, I'm looking to everyone. We need to work together on this. Um, they will review, the Commission will review the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive. And there's a lot that can be done uh, potentially there. But it's also work at local level, all across the member states to, to simplify that. Uh, and final uh, small point on, on charging. We would say that uh, if, if you think about it, imagine you buy a really expensive electric vehicle. Would you really leave it? for eight hours somewhere in Matongi to charge? Probably not. And I think it's quite important that when we look at consumer behavior, probably especially where it comes to uh, targeted public funds, European funds, for example, clean transport funds you talk about, we should be spending it on fast and ultra-fast charging across the core network in Europe, intercity, on the motorways, because that's where we'll need it. As we have more cars in all the other places, working places, uh, shopping malls, because there'll be more cars, there'll be higher utilization rates, so business case will, will drive infrastructure in, 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 other, in other areas. Um, so that's all what I have to say. Look forward to to, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia.
And uh, since we have uh, 15 minutes left, uh, I would really open now the floor for questions, since I see that there are already. Uh, so our panel can provide a brief, uh, brief uh, uh, response. So please, there are the first and then the second. A mic is coming. You can identify yourself and say to whom the question is addressed to. Hi, uh, Chen Weihua, China Daily. Yeah, I mean, after hearing Mike Pompey talk a lot about Europe should not cooperate with China within 5G. So I'm curious to know how you think Europe, EU, and China should cooperate in this uh, EV market. I mean, you mentioned, uh, Julia, I mean, European car makers already invested. I am aware of Volkswagen's activities. So it seems to me it's not just a business makes a good business sense. It's also a moral issue because China and EU are both uh, uh, advocate for um, the uh, climate change front end. Uh, so we're not going to live very long if we don't heed the <laughs> United Nations warning. So I, I just uh, like to hear, I mean, the panel talk about how you think uh, China, you should actually, and, uh, and uh, the world should cooperate more in this regard. Thank you. Maybe, and then we have a second one right there. Uh, Nico Kepens from DG Defco Commission, but asking on my own behalf. Uh, what we haven't heard about is the electricity provision. What if there are more and more electricity ca electric cars? Will there be enough electricity? Or do we have to keep the, the nuclear plants? Yeah, probably that is for Eric. So, Julia, do you want to go ahead with Very the quickly, first yes. question? Um, on, well, I think it's also quite interesting to, to hear what the industry have to say. Well, if we're speaking globally in the world for, you know, for, for the cooperation, I think the electric vehicle pie personally, is big enough for everyone. It's a huge market. Just in Europe alone, I think Commission estimates we have 250 billion worth of the battery market. So it's I absolutely think we should, uh, we should cooperate. I also think today, when it comes to a lot of technology and equipment, China is actually leading. So there's also a lot of learning that European companies and value chain can do from China. So cooperation is very important. But I think that the point of this discussion here is to make sure as we cooperate and as the pie is big for everyone, we do take a slice of that pie. So we need to be smart about how to do that while there's enough for everyone. Eric? On electricity supply, uh, yes, I think, uh, and I'm not the, the specialist, but uh, we discuss a lot with uh, our supplier, with regulator and energy, and there is no doubt it's not a question of production. If you look at uh, all the numbers, uh, basically one million uh, electric cars, I have, sorry, the number for France in my mind, uh, if we have tomorrow 100 electric, uh, one million electric cars charging uh, in France, it represents less than the decrease, natural decrease of electricity demand due to electricity uh, saving uh, that we do with LEDs, etc. So the total energy at the uh, country or continent level is not an issue. The power is not an issue at all at the continent level. Uh, or at the country level, because even if all the cars were charging at the same time, it represents, to give you an idea, once again, this one million cars, uh, it would represent the same gap in terms of consumption, power uh, take, than if you have three degrees difference between today and yesterday at the same time. So the power, the energy is not an issue at the global scale, the power is not an issue, which, what we, which can be an issue is at the local scale in a neighborhood, and that's why we need to work actively on smart uh, grid, on smart charging, etc. And that's why we are implementing it already. It's live in the Netherlands. I, uh, it will come in other country because it's a way to create value and bring this value to the customer to reduce the cost of EV and make it grow. So it's a solution, not a problem. Ishak, would you like to? No, I mean, I, I, I wanted to stress the last point, which is uh, actually, I, I would call it the, the retail distribution, you know, the, the last mile uh, to, the, to the consumer. That's probably a, a significant uh, issue. Certainly if you're uh, talking about uh, fast chargers, uh, because a, a house has got, uh, what, uh, three, four kilowatts, uh, yeah, usage, that's what, about a house is foreseen. 
a, a fast charger is, is 10 times more. So if you start to install fast chargers, which by the way, uh, I learned cost around 50,000 euro a, a, a piece, yeah? you significantly have to strengthen the, the last mile distribution of the electricity. Yeah, I'd like to come back to the question on what should EU and China do to cooperate and perhaps actually also extend it to, to the US uh, here. I think what's really very important is to get a global market for electric vehicles to drive down the costs uh, and to get much more experience scale effects here. So I think the, the one most important thing perhaps is to keep our markets open for each other so that we can reach that critical scale here. Um, that's particularly important for standard setting here. If we get standard standards that are specific in each market here, we will lose each time a lot of economies of scale here. So trying to keep open our markets here and have standards uh, that are applying globally here, I think is really an important part. Of course, there is also collaboration in technology and whatever, but I think keeping our markets open is the biggest push. Uh, yeah. There is another question there and then one on the front. Nicholas Listel, DG Computation, but speaking in a personal function. Um, I would like to, it was briefly mentioned that uh, um, electric vehicles is just one of the three trends affecting the automotive industry, the other two being uh, new mobility, so ride hailing, car sharing, um, and the, uh, there's the third one being um, connected and autonomous driving. Um, could you explain a little bit more how these uh, three trends interplay and, and uh, interact and reinforce each other? Hi, I'm Sanjeev Kumar. The mic is coming just a second. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Sanjeev Kumar. I'm the founder of Change Partnership at Think Tank. I, I wanted to address my question to Jacques because I thought you made some pretty controversial mm -hmm. statements. I'd be interested if you could put some numbers on them. Um, firstly, when you talked about consumer desirability, you talked about cost. Now, we all know the history of the automotive sector. Cars became, well, the car industry when it took off was when the Ford company introduced Ford loans to allow their employees to buy the cars at a subsidised rate. So that kind of business model could quickly accelerate over and over again. Um, I'm interested to know if you think that can apply to the hydrogen uh, industry. Secondly, you said that hydrogen and electrolysis are cheap. Can you put some numbers um, on that statement, please? And then thirdly, uh, the bit that's missing from your model um, is kind of consumer uh, desire. So if you talk to anybody now, very few people want to buy anything other than a, a Tesla Model 3 or a Tesla with the doors are up now um, in, a, in a funny way because the branding is so important. If you take the iPhone, the iPhone pretty much went from Z. So am I talking too fast? No, no, I, I didn't understand the word that you used in, in the last. A car that? Yes. Yeah, okay. So let me just finish the, let me just make the last point. I'm going to summarize all my points again because I, I don't think you're paying attention clearly. Um, uh, the third point is, is that if you look at uh, consumer desirability again, if you look at the what car assessment in the UK, which just came out this January, <coughs> they had the e Nero, the Kaya e Nero as the number one car, not just in electric vehicles, but also overall against all the alternative types of vehicles that are out there in the market. Within uh, um, one month, all 900 units had sold out. So that's an example of the speed at which consumers uh, uh, pick up technology. So if you could just answer the question about the hydrogen costs, everything. Uh, I think the, the three uh, moves that you were mentioning are extremely consistent I, uh, and, and kind of nourish each other. Uh, autonomous and uh, EV. Uh, clearly, I mentioned before that uh, EV and EV dedicated platform can make much mm -hmm. uh, more roomy car and uh, when you have a roomy car then you can enjoy the autonomousness of the uh, of the car uh, on the other side it's much easier to make autonomous an electric car than a combustion engine car because it's easier to control uh, electric equipment so those two nourish each other uh, if you talk about new mobility and uh, electric vehicle, clearly today we are uh, the leader in Europe with more than 5,000 uh, electric cars in um, car sharing or car hailing. And clearly we can see that car sharing is now, uh, the tender we have is about 80% electric. Uh, first, because it applies to city center where more and more constraints are on combustion engine. And second, because from a logistic point of view, the recharging 
uh, is much more simple to manage uh, for, for the operator in terms of cost of ownership. So I think those, uh, really those three are very tough for us because it puts a huge burden in terms of R&D. Uh, that's, that's a big challenge for all uh, OEM. But the good news is that they kind of, uh, they are very consistent to each other. Really quick comment as well on, on, on the three R um, revolutions in mobility. I think I agree they're very complementary, and I would say it's really important that the three R together, mm -hmm. so electric, autonomous, uh, and shared, for a really sustainable mobility system in the future. If you just have autonomous cars and they're allowed to be um, well, internal combustion engine, obviously emissions go up. If you have them autonomous and electric, it's already better, and the technologies are very compatible, but you really risk increasing the amount of cars. And that is a real and genuine concern. It's very easy to drive disabled people, um, older people, people who don't have driving license, all can be circling around. You can program your car to just be driving around, not to park. So it's only when you add the, the really the, the shared, the new mobility bit that you make the system really sustainable in terms of the livelable cities congestion and, and so forth. So three together are important. <laughs> I, I, I had three and I'm not sure I understood still the third one, but okay. Um, on, on, on affordability, I think uh, if, if you look at the, the current offer, uh, it's very difficult to find a car uh, below list price. Yeah? I'm not talking including subsidies or, or discounts by the, uh, by the manufacturer. To, uh, to find a car below 25,000 uh, uh, euro. And when, when you see the cars that, are, um, that have the longest range are um, premium cars because uh, they are bigger and the cost of the system and the battery compared to the overall cost of the vehicle is, is much more reasonable. Now, it's exactly the same for hydrogen systems. Um, fuel cells in a small car will be very difficult to fit and to justify economically. But if you start talking about buses or trucks that make long distances, then hydrogen is really a, 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 a valuable uh, proposition. So I don't know if I'm answering your question on, on affordability. The cost of uh, hydrogen, currently hydrogen uh, is at retail in most of the countries, in, uh, in, in Germany and in Norway, um, are uh, around nine euro a kilo. Um, but um, contacts with um, distributors and, and uh, electrolysis uh, manufacturers, informal contacts, indicate that uh, that could go down to uh, five euro. And then, sorry, but I'm not, a, if you could repeat your last question. The, I, I guess it yeah. was a reference to Tesla, yeah. no? No. Okay. It's okay. So, <laughs> thank you. We have uh, four minutes, and uh, I would like to seize uh, this little time left to push you a little bit more on the issue of batteries, because we understand that battery is the core of the electric vehicle. We understand that 40% of the value of an electric vehicle is in the battery, and if we look at the production graphs that uh, Renil has shown, Europe is simply not there. So, where can Europe? extrapolate value out of this value chain for electric vehicles in the future? And can Europe have a role to play in batteries as well? Under which conditions? Is the uh, Airbus of, uh, of batteries that the Commission is proposing the right way to, to foster uh, innovation and production in this field? Eric? So I think several steps in the answer. First step is, uh, of course, at the beginning, volume were small. We could not afford several industrial sites for the batteries. And it was started for whatever reason in Asia, and it stayed in Asia. Now we are starting the second phase, where all the Asian battery manufacturers are opening plants, giving jobs to Europe, uh, uh, European employees in, uh, in Europe, mainly Eastern Europe. Uh, we have our batteries now supplied from Poland and, and also from Slovakia, etc. So this is a kind of second, uh, second step. The third step is clearly to create a, a company or a player that has a global role because this industry will anyway be global in terms of R&D, in terms of technology. The, the investments are so huge that you cannot survive on one continent. 
but for which Europe has to play a strong role on the R&D side and on, um, on the industrial side. We are really convinced that it's possible to do that, and we will support that under the condition, of course, that it is competitive. Otherwise, uh, it cannot uh, uh, survive. So we are very active in this area. And I would say our strong belief is that the next generation of the battery is the right time to catch up, which means it's now, huh? because uh, the, the product that will be developed uh, on the market in 23, 24, we are deciding them today. So we need, next year we will decide which battery we put in there. So if we don't have a strong offer from a European uh, or, or Europeans uh, battery maker, it will not uh, happen. But the, I think the technology shift is the unique opportunity to catch up again. Uh, otherwise, if we are on a kind of uh, continuous improvement mode, I guess uh, the, 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 the Chinese and Korean are so much in advance that yeah. it will be difficult to catch up. Okay, thank you very much. I disclose a conflict of interest uh, behind this question is that with Renilde we are working on a new paper devoted to research and innovation in batteries only. So you will soon be invited again at Bruegel for another event, this time devoted to batteries. In the meantime, let me, let me thank you all for the participation. Hope you enjoyed the event, you learned something, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.